For the next session, we have Devjani Ghosh, President NASCOM, in conversation with four rock stars. No, no, it's not the usual suspects, but these are young leaders who are paving their way to make an impact in the society. There's so much to take away and learn from them on driving the change we want to see in the world and creating impact. These young stars have been associated and nurtured by 1M1B, 1M1B, 1 million for 1 billion, is a United Nations accredited not-for-profit organization. They engage young people on aspirational socio-economic opportunities and mentor them to become active change makers. 1M1B's initiatives are present in 200 plus schools, engaging 15K plus students annually with top students in schools. Please join me in welcoming Lakshya Sobodh from DPS Bangalore, Madhav Malik from JP Public School Noida, Nandini Raju from CHI REC International School Hyderabad and Nikita Nambiar from Barnard School Columbia University. Over to you, Dev Jani. So thank you so much, Rhea. And uh, I, I have to say that done a lot of conversations, interviews, talked to a lot of leaders, but this is one session that I was both looking forward to and, and terribly nervous about. I mean, I am today talking to four people, four youngsters who can teach all of us, um, you know, the, the meaning of truly being change agents. But, you know, I'm not going to waste a lot of time in the preamble and uh, talking about the work they're doing. I want them to talk about the work they're doing. So I'm going to just dive directly into it. And my first question is to all four of you, Madhav, Nikita, Lakshya, Nandini. You know, uh, the only silver lining that I actually see in this pandemic is that it has given us that once in an opportunity, lifetime opportunity to actually pause and figure out how we want to go forward. You know, what kind of a world do we really want and how do we build that, that future? So each of you, I mean, I'm just so inspired by your stories, by what you have done, by what you are doing. To me, you stand for the power of change that we talk about, where each of you have shown that it just takes one person um, to start that spark, to light that spark, to start change. So my first question, I would love for each of you to give me your perspective. You know, we're talking about the decade. We're talking about the next 10 years, which is going to be powered by, uh, by technology like we have never seen before. Um, where we are going to see disruption like we have never seen before, innovation like we have never seen before. What is it that you would want this world, this future of ours to stand for if you were given a choice um, to get one thing done? So I'll start maybe with you, Lakshya. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, you know, firstly, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity, ma'am. Uh, thanks to you and NASCOM for including us. Uh, to answer your question, uh, let me begin by saying that, uh, firstly, I am a strong advocate for youth participating in industry. Uh, I would like to see a future where no one is left behind, right? I would love to see a future where young people are participating with the industries and in building the new India. You know, for instance, uh, let's talk about, say, Web 3.0. It has so much to offer. Uh, and the required skills are what young people really have, you know, uh, ranging from digital creativity to storytelling to content creators, uh, some things which are very common amongst all of us. You know, we youth can supercharge the creator's economy. And I think that, you know, say the Web 3.0 will be the future of creators. So the basic idea, or I would say the change I would like to see is that, you know, can we youth participate in the industry much early on? And, you know, not just we youth, but say youth from tier three towns, youth from villages, uh, youth from all over India, you know, uh, can we make, say, any such initiative in the future that is more inclusive, where people like us are a part of the discussion? I would like to 
you know, I would like to contribute now rather than waiting to enter in the workforce. I would like to be a part of the India growth story now because I imagine a India where no one is left behind. Uh, India is like, say, is full of youth potential and just that youth need to be given the opportunity to participate in the economy, something which I really, really hope uh, to see in the future. Well, you know, when I look at the work that you guys are doing and so many other youngsters, I think I think we lose out if you don't have the opportunity to participate. And after all, you're the ones who will be inheriting the future. So I absolutely believe that you should have every right in figuring out how it's shaped. That's a wonderful and very powerful thought, Lakshya. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to you, Nandini. Um, what's the one thing you want to see change? So um, even I would like to really thank you for this opportunity to express our ideas on this platform. So the journey from the farm to our tables is an increasingly complicated one. Food is a big business with supply chains crisscrossing across the globe, technology infusing every link, and production being higher than ever. Yet, it is estimated that 60% of India's population will experience severe food deficiencies by 2050. Many of the practices that were designed to feed the planet have produced unintended consequences from widespread deforestation to water pollution to the destruction of the very soil beneath our feet. Hence, one change I would like to see is the use of sustainable farming methodologies, such as zero budget natural farming. Imagine a world where one can use locally sourced inputs like cow dung, cow urine and plant organic matter by totally avoiding the use of inorganic fertilizers and pesticides. The practice is not only environmentally friendly, but also cost effective, owing primarily to the use of easily available low cost farm inputs. Wow. Excellent. Uh, Madhav, I'll move on to you. Your one wish. Yes. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So if I think uh, in the future, I want people would be able to collaborate and give back to the society. No matter what their interests or area of work might be, we as responsible citizens should always keep service to the community at the forefront, such that to help the underserved people. This way, we would be able to promote inclusion in a true sense. Irrespective of one's caste, creed, or race, people should collaborate to deliver change. We presently define success as the possession of materialistic assets. However, one should be equally vocal and active about giving back to the society. To bring change, you have to be the change. Absolutely. And uh, Nikita, last word, last, last uh, answer from you on this topic. So my fellow panelists answered very well. Um, and I'm just going to echo off of what Baksh said, actually. So to start off with, I just want to say that change and what it means to bring change is very subjective. And the magnitude of the change that we create is also varied, right? Um, you know, we like to think that you only create change if you've done something that has tremendous impact. But sometimes that's not the case. Just, you know, changing from, you know, cows using dairy to using oat milk, small change that could affect the way that, you know, our, you know, it can, affect the day-to-day -day, um, cycle of our life. But um, the change that I want to talk about right now is youth involvement, like Lux said, but from a different angle. So when I think about my own personal journey to starting my nonprofit, I started very young when I was 14. And it was hard to take a 14-year-old seriously. I mean, imagine this small child coming up to you with a piece of paper saying, I want to help the prison, sy help the prison system in India. I want to make it better you wouldn't take that small voice seriously. But I was able to have such an impact scaling from 15 prisoners to over 100 because of the people who listened, because of the people who accepted my word and trusted in me and in my thoughts. And so today to the listeners, what I wanna say is I hope that we, the young people on this panel, the young people in your life, I hope we're listened to. I hope that our voices are heard and our actions resonated with. And hopefully the messages that, come way, that we convey, like in today's panel, don't fall on deaf ears. 
thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for giving us youth the voice um, to be able to tell our thoughts freely. Um, yeah, it's greatly appreciated. So the one key takeaway as an adult, as the adult on the panel, is that we have to do, we have to work much harder um, towards becoming better listeners. And I cannot agree more with you. I absolutely believe we do. You know, all of you talked about the power of inclusion, Nandini brought in the power of sustainability. And both inclusion and sustainability, to me, are sort of, uh, the two bedrocks of, you know, a, a, a future uh, that that we would all want, we would like to leave behind for our kids and that you would want to inherit, right? And they, they're such powerful concepts. Um, it, I know we are not doing enough. I absolutely know we are not doing enough when it comes to... Um, ensuring that inclusion, almost inclusion and sustainability becomes a design principle of everything we do, be it from how we run our business, donations, et cetera. And maybe as we try and figure out how to embed it, embed uh, this into the, the core thinking um, of the future narrative, I absolutely hope that we do listen to your voices because um, I think there's a lot we can learn from. I'm going to move over to a few personal experiences and let me let me start with you, Nandini and Lakshya. Um, you know, your stories are so, so inspiring. Uh, Lakshya, the work you are doing to help rural India fight the COVID pandemic. Nandini, um, you are all of 16 year old and you're working with farmers to move them from chemical farming to zero budget natural farming. I mean, it's just amazing to even think about it. What is the biggest challenge that both of you have faced um, when you were trying to drive these changes, whether it is convincing someone that they have to mask up or take a vaccine, or whether it is working with farmers to say that what you have done for so many years is actually not good for you and you need to try out something new. So what is the biggest challenge that each of you have faced? I'll go ahead first. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, the biggest challenge, uh, I would say, first of all, the biggest realization is that, you know, to it is difficult to make change. And uh, it is more difficult when you do it alone. So I would, you know, just a short story. Uh, I would just say I was very passionate about reducing fake news and discrimination. Uh, I am passionate about peaceful societies and creating a world where peace is restored, right? So I have always been attached to rural India ever since I was small. And during the pandemic, I was really disturbed with the hatred and discrimination towards rural India, especially during the migrant crisis. And thinking about the hardship rural India was facing, uh, you know, that had really bothered me. And I thought that, you know, why can't I do something about it? I thought that why can't why can't I educate people in the villages of India to on how to tackle say fake news and discrimination and most importantly how to fight the COVID pandemic and uh, just a few months after giving my tenth board exam uh, I had created an initiative called uh, Rural COVID Warriors where we aim to educate the rural crowd on how to fight the COVID nineteen pandemic and also the bigger pandemic associated with fake news and discrimination. So working towards, uh, I would say the rural crowd, I think language barrier and scalability has been uh, my biggest task so far. You know, the biggest challenge was to make something that's language independent. Uh, you know, as we know that there are around say 21 main languages and over 19,000 other languages and dialects, I guess. Uh, so the main concern was how are we going to develop a curriculum which is scalable and how can it reach as many people as possible? Uh, but to overcome this, I think an idea started brewing from a simple observation that, you know, say if cartoons, uh, if animations and no dialogue comedies like, say, Charlie Chaplin can entertain people and make people laugh, then why can't we educate people on COVID-19 in a similar manner, which is fun and engaging? So I had decided to combine my talent of uh, storytelling and animation for informing people about rural or about COVID-19 and making it specifically uh, language agnostic. So the main idea behind the curriculum all of a sudden was how can we use animation to raise awareness on COVID and educate people on the same. And at this particular moment, I had started making sketches. I had started making uh, storyboards, which I had never done before. 
but i had one main goal and one main purpose and that was to direct these animations in such a way that it is easy for the rural population to understand and it does not require any dialogue especially it does not require any dialogue to convey the message or the topic of the video uh, we made around 3 to 4 animation videos and covered vital modules of our curriculum and uh, i am proud to say that we were successful in breaking that language barrier uh, which was our biggest task uh, so far and you know what you've done can be used for so many i mean just basic education on say washing your hands daily right which can save so many lives in, in rural india i mean it can be done to educate them on so many different things so i think it's a fantastic process you've started i hope you don't give it up lakshya um, and i hope that uh, you get a lot of people supporting you to take it forward nandini what about you uh, working with farmers working with the traditional sector legacy sector how did you bring about change and what was your biggest challenge um so when we started our project nritya meaning good earth in sanskrit we wanted to help the farmers as much as possible in fact we had so many ideas ranging from fundraisers to retail market connections to awareness sessions but our primary objective was to convert farmers from chemical farming to zero budget natural farming With that said, there were challenges at every step. But the major challenge we faced was to create awareness and convert farmers to a more sustainable practice by educating them. Most of the farmers, like you've mentioned, are very well adjusted to their chemical farming methods, and they're unaware of the health and environmental cost that it brings. We thought simply educating them would help, but surprisingly. till today they're still really glued to their practices and believe that zero budget natural farming is not worth the wait and risk fundamentally there is a lack of long term evidence in terms of whether adoption of zbnf practices improves or maintains crop yields when compared to alternative farming systems there are currently only short term experiment results and this alone is not sufficient to convince the farmers This will continue to be a huge barrier and the best way we thought to overcome it is to have senior experienced ZBNF farmers themselves convince the other farmers to switch by showing them proof of all the benefits. For this we reached out to a farmer Tara Chand Bale in Madhya Pradesh who switched from chemical farming to natural farming and he has helped 10 states across India as well as Nepal and Canada in conducting sessions. Yeah. On this front our finance minister has recently announced for the budget to revise the syllabi in agricultural universities to incorporate chemical free farming practices this is actually a great initiative however it would also be great if we had a policy wherein every farmer is educated on these practices and not just the students who are studying agriculture we need those universities to come to the farmers or the farmers to reach out to the universities Wow, fabulous, uh, Madhav Nikita. Both of you are working on empowering women. Uh, Madhav, you worked with the lace workers in Telangana to uh, talk them to earn their livelihood. Nikita, you're doing amazing work with women in uh, inmates of uh, jails like Tumkur, etc. Uh, it's it's obvious that both of you believe that. women participation in the economy is absolutely critical in fact i believe that without that uh, you you cannot you can never achieve the ambition of a 5 trillion gdp for india because if you don't involve women you're leaving behind 50% of your of your of your population which just doesn't make sense um any thoughts or any suggestions to the corporate leaders that are here today that are listening to you so is government uh what can india do differently to really bring in women at scale uh, and increase their participation in the econ- economy all right um, can i go first sure yeah all right so i once said in a book that entrepreneurship is not a profession it is a state of mind presently in india only 13% of entrepreneurs are women they are the ones who have fought against the odds to deliver exemplary solutions to problems uh, you know ideas and the zeal to make it a reality come to us irrespective of our gender corporates and the government should also thereby provide means by which women entrepreneurs can grow and succeed the women entrepreneurs in india have to face challenges such as cultural biases 
and a lack of business resources such as finances, training, and development. Anyone can think of building new things. Um, let me share one example from the project I just did. Uh, the women lace workers in Narsapur, Andhra Pradesh, were passionate about their work. They loved the age-old tradition of lace making, but they lacked the market connection and were unable to sustain their business. Me and my team, as a part of the Purpose Academy, uh, which is a program by 1M1B and UC Berkeley, identified this problem and started to think critically about how we can bridge the gap and help them maintain their business. However, we were only a few students trying to solve a business-related problem uh, with limited access to uh, resources ourselves. I'm sure there exist numerous such problems in our country waiting to be solved, for which I think the government can provide the means and resources much more efficiently. Okay. Nikita, any thoughts on what can be done to uh, break the barriers and bring in scale? This is a great question. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a simple or even a correct answer. When we look at the recent estimated statistics, um, India's rate of female participation in our formal labor force is only 24%, which is among the lowest in developing nations. And if you really think about it, it's hard to develop in an inclusive and sustainable way when, as you said, half of our population is not even participating fully in our economy. And when you look at numbers alone, the female labor force participation rates and rates of gender-based violence, which is something many people don't consider, is unacceptably high in our country. And to add to that, a majority of Indian women work in the informal sector. So these are jobs with limited social protection and very low wages. But that's not to say that our government hasn't had some success. India has taken steps to advance women's financial inclusion through the Aadhaar program. Um, and there are also promising signs of the government for skilling programs aimed towards women, as well as subsidized loans for businesses led by women. These are all great, but let's cut to the chase. What can we do to indict a change, right? It's imperative that we force the system to think and act in a gender just way. Um, this means ensuring this gender disaggregated data is collected, reported, and used for decision making. So not just for hiring, but also to fill in blind spots. So like I said, social protection, financial inclusion. We need to include women in these governmental schemes. Most employment programs also have failed to retain women for long-term jobs. Uh, in fact, the statistic is that most women drop out within three minutes, uh, uh, th not three minutes, sorry, three months of um, joining their job because of the lack of financial incentive to stay. So I wanna conclude by saying that it's important for us to prioritize women all the more now. We have to keep them central to the immediate post-pandemic recovery pipeline and also stay focused on them for longer as strategic and logical partners. Um, and this will benefit us in a very widespread way. That's that's my brief answer to this. But as I said, you know, there's no correct way that we can tackle this. And it's a, it's a deep seated issue. And once we cut it at its roots, once we understand the true roots is only when we can start solving it. That's step-by-step process. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not just a deep seated issue, right? It's also deeply embedded into culture. It's deeply embedded into mindset. And the most difficult thing that one can do is change how people think or, or how they have thought for millions and millions of years. But, but, but yeah, I, I just take uh, you know, a lot of heart in the fact that we are making progress. We are hope, we are, thankfully, we are not go, going back. We are making progress. And hopefully a few generations down the line, um, they will be having conversations which are very different from the ones we are having today. So that's that's what I look forward to. Um, if, you know, we have around ten minutes left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get into a few quick questions and with with all of you. Um, Madhav, you are an AI enthusiast, and uh, you know it's fantastic to see the kind of work you've been doing internship at IBM. Congratulations, by the way. Um, Simple question, is AI going to kill all of us? No, no, AI is not going <laughs> to kill all of us. Till the time we 
you know, uh, expand AI to a rate where it's sustainable, it can help people. You know, we have to take care of the privacy issues, all the uh, bias issues that are related with AI, but I don't see any danger with AI killing jobs or us. Thank you. That's very reassuring coming from you. Um, uh, you know, one, one other question, Lakshya, you talked about Web3, but I'll open this up to any one of you who want to answer. There is a lot happening with Web3 coming in, Metaverse becoming more and more a reality, a lot of interest, at least hype building up around Metaverse. There's also a lot of concern about what does this do? Does this further uh, take away? I know one of our speakers, Yuval, Professor Yuval Harari, I'm sure all of you have heard about it, talked about, talked about, about him, talked about how we are losing our humanity to technology. And that's why he believes we are actually one of the last generations uh, that will that will of 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 humans uh, that that this uh, world will see. Uh, do you all worry about that? That you know, with so much of technology, with metaverse creating a completely virtual uh, life, that we're somehow gonna get disconnected with our humanity. And any anything that you all feel that can be done to balance it out. I'll, I'll, I'll open it up. Anyone who wants to jump in first. I mean, I can, I can go ahead. Uh, so firstly, I think, yeah, you know, uh, as it sounds, Meta was uh, Web 3.0. It does seem very fascinating uh, at first instance, but the more you look at it, you're like, yeah, you are going to get detached to say how we used to live before. Right? Like, I think uh, H&M was the first store that opened up on metaverse and yeah. it seemed really cool uh you know once you hear about metaverse but at the same time you also think that you know uh we are shifting into a completely new tech generation right uh i i was when i was small i saw the shift uh from you know these fancy consoles these uh you know iphone coming in and it was just a gradual shift but i would say yeah this is like a whole new thing and it's really fascinating but I really do believe that it's going to detach from how we used to live at least for the last 10, 20 years. So though it may sound very fascinating, I am very, um, I am double-minded about it. I don't know if it's going to be very beneficial, but it does really sound cool to all of us, but I just know it's going to, uh, detach how we should just live for the past few years. Once the new tech generations coming in, like the metaverse. And since all of you are working on inclusion, do you think these kind these technologies are they because they they're not I mean, intuition is not a design principle as yet. So do you think they're gonna they're gonna br uh, strengthen the divide further? Um, so I think that you know with these AI technologies and other technologies, we are working on inclusion to include even the underprivileged people and people with disabilities as well. Right. So all of these technologies are actually helping us bridge the gap and bring uh, resources to the people who don't have it yet. Right. So I think uh, in the future, there are going to be two different things. It's very ambivalent. And yes, uh, it might happen that, you know, things can go south. But majorly, I think with these technologies, inclusion would be at focus and we would be able to get resources even to the underprivileged people. Is there any message to all the tech leaders who are listening to you? If there is one thing they need to do differently, what should they be doing? Um, I think that, you know, when we are building about any new technology or any new solution to the market, we need to test how the technology is performing, whether there are any ethical concerns. And, you know, when we, when we train an AI model, there is usually an AI bias introduced to the model automatically. So we need to extensively check that, you know, how to reduce that AI bias and so that, you know, nobody's discriminated or nobody's harmed because of the new technology that we are bringing in. So that's it. I mean, uh, new technologies can definitely help us. It has the potential to solve some of the world's biggest challenges, but we have to do it in the right way, play the cards right, and everything will turn out great. Amen. And I hope so. Nikita, any words of advice to the, to the leaders from you? So I was just... Yeah, well, Madhav was talking. I was just thinking about this as well. So I'm not the most techie person, um, <laughs> but I do understand that there is this fear that we have as a society that, you know, tech is taking over and maybe not for the better. Um, but 
See, I'm of the opinion that what makes us fundamentally human is our value to connect with people. It's our empathy, right? So prioritizing tech that also prioritizes empathy, making these new connections, I think that's the way to go. And when we think about the metaverse, you know, you, you get to, um, again, I'm not the most well-read on this, but you get to establish connections. What I said was that mm -hmm. truly human thing with people who are even across the globe. When we look at Instagram, Facebook, these are all just ways that we are forming new connections, ways that are making us in some sort of twisted, ironic way, more human. And this is the new generation. So I think it's time for us to prepare for that. Understand that um, we are progressing, we are developing, and with development comes change, innovation, and inclusion, which is the whole point of this panel today, to speak about topics like that. So yeah, that's, that's my message. Um, that's my hope for industry leaders, for tech leaders. Um, yeah. That's, that, that's such a powerful and beautiful message. And it's so interesting because... So many of us sort of think technology and think um, of what can go wrong. And it was so refreshingly wonderful to hear you talk about, you know, how you actually see these as, uh, you know, just, just strengthening the connects between humans. I guess, I guess it all boils down to us, right? As humans, how do we want to use it or how don't we want to use it? Ultimately, it's us who's responsible. So I know we are out of time, but I'm going to, very quickly, one last question to each of you. You know, 10, 15 years down the line, um, when you are in your 30s, who do you want, if there's one living person, a role model that you say that this is the person I want to be like, you know, this is what I want to achieve or this is who I want to be, who would that be? Um, Nikita, since I can see you on my screen, I'll start with you. This is a really hard question, and I'm not so sure if I have an answer for this. I, my entire childhood, you know, I was brought up on the principle of just trying to be the best version of yourself. And I guess that meant that I never really compared myself to others. I never had that um, role model figure that I wanted to become because I just wanted to be the best version of me. I just. Oh, wow. That, that's yeah. a really good answer. You're going to be the best, best version of yourself. That's Thank an you. absolutely brilliant answer. I love that. Um, Lakshya? So, yeah, this is the one question which I always keep thinking about because my role models have changed almost every year. You know, uh, when I was young, when I wanted to become a cricketer, uh, when cricket was my dream, I wanted to be someone like Mahindra Singh Dhoni because of the way he leads the team, the way his, uh, you know, the way he's passionate about, uh, you know, the team winning the World Cup. And then when I shifted to, you know, as my interests keep developing from football to, uh, you know, the social initiatives, and now I really want to enter the entertainment tech industry. So I really want to be someone like uh say Shah Rukh Khan like I I love the way he is I love I, I've been a big fan of him since the beginning and my dream is to open up maybe one of the largest production houses here in India you know I would love to open up say a Pixar or Universal in India where we can produce high quality content and you know hopefully why I even about, better hopefully, hopefully even much better, better much better <laughs> and uh, the reason why I told Shah Rukh Khan is because I'm a big fan of his production house which is Red Chili's Entertainment because I believe that they have very specialized VFX entertainment and uh, VFX tech. And that's something which I really want to get into. And I want to, uh, you know, set up my own production house, maybe uh, a well-established production house so that we can have like a Pixar of India. Oh, that's, a, you know? that's a wonderful role model. And may the force be with you. Thank really you. look forward to that. Madhav, your answer, quick answer, because otherwise they're going to cut us. Yes, sure. Uh, so just like Nikita said, you know, you always have to compare yourself to who you were yesterday. So I have always been inspired by one of my teachers. Uh, her name was Miss Ruchika. She always talked about how to think positively and, you know, just having a positive thought can improve your life and make changes in a positive manner. So I'm just yeah. inspired by her and uh, she loved to serve the community. She worked with children and all. So I hope to do the same. Yes. Lovely, lovely. Nandini. So this is kind of building on what Nikita said. I don't necessarily look up to a person, but I think I look up to like a good mix of qualities. Like in a certain person, I can see that they're caring. In another person, drive for change. Another person could be like 
a critical thinker. So it's necessarily like combining the best qualities of every person I know into becoming the best version of myself. I hope all of you will, you mean you are the best versions of yourself. And I hope all of you will remain the best versions of yourselves because as you do that, you will just inspire so many more to be the best version of themselves. You inspire me through this conversation to be the best version of myself. So it was just fabulous speaking to all of you. And I guess uh, to the audience, my only message is, you know, it is time we, we practice some serious reverse mentoring. It is time that we reached out uh, to the younger generation to hear what they have to say because they have they have a lot to say and a lot of what they are saying makes tremendous sense, um, especially as we navigate this um, hyper-digital world. So I think it's tremendously important. And, you know, as we, it, it, it's all about learning. And through this conversation, the one thing was very clear, the way these kids are learning, they're not, you know, it, it's, it's outside curriculum. They're learning from life experiences. They're learning from each other. And I think if there's one message I would like to leave you with is today learning is the most important thing that each of us can invest in. It's going to have the biggest dividends going forward and there is no good age for learning. So once again, a huge thanks to all of you. All of you were brilliant. And my best wishes for everything you do today and the future. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity again. What an absolutely delightful start conversation for the day. Thank you, Devjani, and all those young leaders for the eye-opener of a session that that was. This pandemic has definitely given us an opportunity to pause and reflect on the world that we want to live in and how we need to build the world going forward. And the four of you have shown us that you stand for the power of change. It takes just one person to spark that. Uh, all the best to all of you and all of your initiatives. It's incredible to see the kind of minds that are shaping up. And the future, if it's in the hands of these youngsters, surely seems a lot, lot more promising.